Hey, everybody, it's John. It is Heavy Things Lightly. Today, Dr. Don Muir, PhD from Cambridge and an educationist teaching kids up in Winnipeg, Canada, gives us the insight. We talk about all kinds of things, but what's it like to teach in a system that may not always be working toward something you agree with? She gives us great insight on Canada, the educational system, and the breakdown of culture. Dr. Dawn, today, real quick, two things. Art of Tamada, tickets are available. That's a weekend where we go deep dive on the art of hospitality by offering Georgian hospitality and teaching you the tools to throw the Supra, the Georgian capy all around the world. Please come check it out on the website, www.first-things.org. Second thing, all you guys, listen carefully, tell your friends. Our beloved general manager at KP Restaurant here in Greenville is stepping down. It's all good. It's a wonderful experience. He's held down the restaurant. And now we're looking for a new GM. This would be heavy on marketing and reaching out and spreading this First Things Foundation nonprofit restaurant into the world. But it's also some managerial skills. We're looking for one of you guys that love this stuff to consider coming in running our restaurant. Really, you'd be just simply one of the executives here at First Things trying to do our work by making this restaurant even better than it already is. And it's pretty hot. So we're looking for a restaurant person, preferably, but we're maybe we're looking for you to come and do something amazing. Make a commitment to a year or two or five or ten to grow our restaurant into something even better than it is. That's an advertisement to our community, and I wanted to start with that. So reach out, write me, John Hears at firstthings.org, or write Daniel Paternos, Daniel P A D R N O S, Daniel Paternos at firstthings.org. Consider a new job. Now, back to heavy things lightly with Dr. Don Muir from Winnipeg. So, Don, you know, I've been on this as an education binge or something. We had a couple of classical educators on, uh, and you know, our little podcast is growing and I've had a lot of footprints and stuff, including, uh, I was a speaker at a recent little Cersei convention, uh, conference in Raleigh, North Carolina and classical education keeps popping up, but you are going to be today speaking something about like Canadian public education or Canadian education in general, and then also philosophizing with me a little bit about the nature of um, w- the human experience vis-a-vis our new world education system. So I can't wait to hear your expertise on this. Um, so first question is, is how do you, how do you make sense of a world right now that's very um, technological as you sit with these young people and try to figure out the best way to talk to them and to quote, educate them. How, how, how does that part of your job going right now vis-a-vis technology? I, I actually embraced the technology because I came back into the um, teaching system after homeschooling for 15 years. So I felt like a brand new teacher. And so that would have been maybe 15 years ago. Um, for this sort of last leg here. And I really felt like, oh, all of these possibilities are opened up. So we had a whole big drive at that time in our division to get technology in the classroom. So one of the big things you might've heard of was something called a whiteboard or um, a smart board Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where it, yeah, you know about that. And then it's interactive. So you have a pen and then you can project all your, your visuals up on this big, lovely board. Um, My divisional music person also got into my classroom, not just my desktop computer, but also a Mac, which means that I could also um, not only record anything that the kids were doing, um, but also create my own tracks for my performances and things like that. So it was nice for me as a creative person to have all that sort of stuff at my hands. Um, So I would have to say that in terms of just presenting the product, what I'm doing, and engagement. I um, use a lot of the most recent technology in my classroom. Um, But yeah, 
Go ahead. No, no. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't want to interrupt your your thought process. I was going to say we've gotten to know each other through really through our conversations, through Substack, um, through education, through our support and the understanding of symbolic world. I'm an Orthodox Christian. You're not, but you have sympathies in that world. In my world, technology is sort of default bad, but I'm not hearing that from you. Um, no, in terms of enhancing what's already good and engagement. Um, and again, I, I find it an arena where I can be very creative once I've sort of mastered the tools. Um, as a replacement, definitely not. And I know some people, it does turn into that. Um, but for me, I think any educator, if you have tools that can enhance what you're doing and provide engagement, great. Now, if you're talking about things like phones in the classroom, <laughs> That's a whole other thing again. And we went through that whole phase of, oh, yes, we need to embrace the modern world. This is where kids are at. We need to have them not banning these phones in classrooms, but bringing them in and using them to, you know, to broaden their um, research skills through going online and all the rest of that. So, of course, within five, eight years, they're now out of the classroom again because... <laughs> It was so clear that with these little things in their hands, the kids were not using it wisely. It reminds me a bit of Marx saying that, you know, when the world is perfect, the proletariat will all be reading philosophy and, and doing all these wonderful things. Didn't happen. Because, you know, <laughs> it, it, it didn't, didn't happen. Because, I mean, it's just not human nature. Sorry. So when these, um, yeah, so things like phones coming in to be, you know, the latest wave and to be right on it. Um that was a failure. And that's just because I think um, it was an easy way out and people didn't think through what it was that actually engaged kids on their phones. It wasn't just the technology, it was the content. And so if you give them the, con the, the technology with a particular content and then try to say, no, 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 here's the content you should be using on this technology, they did not really buy it. Um, also, too, the limitations of things like research on the Internet, especially for kids. I mean, there's sure there's teaching them about how do you go, you know, how can, how much do you take in from Wikipedia? How much do you take in from sites? Do you go to the fifth site that comes up? And then how does Google work? What brings yeah, it to the top of the is... list? All that stuff, right? Um, which was unforeseen and to be fair, was probably in the process of developing during the same time because that stuff is all just taken off right over the last 10, 15 years, which is just when they were bringing those phones into schools. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I, I wanted you on because of your insights. Uh, I sort of want like voice from the edge, like no way, like the Canadian voice eh, coming in and, 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 and you're, <laughs> you have a really beautiful way. Uh, with words and I think a really deep understanding of this new world, old world break. So tell us about your new world, old world self. H how did you, how did you grow up and how did you become an educator? Because the story that I know is really interesting and I think it'll form the rest of our conversation on some level before we hmm. jump back into education and philosophy. Sure. Well, my parents are Jamaican. Um, and they came up to Canada in the 50s for my dad to go to McGill University, which is one of our big prestigious yep. universities up here. Yep. He became a political economist. And he, um, I think partly because of his interest in politics, but also partly because of his Christian sense of giving to the world, making a difference in the world, he became very involved in um public administration, and I have to say political e economics. So through the Canadian International Development Association, which is a development agency, which is CEDA, he was sent or funded to go to several developing countries while we were growing up. So I had the privilege of um, the family going with him on these assignments. Mm. So we were in... Uh, Somalia when I was four for two years and then we were in Ethiopia where he was kind of trying to reform the civil service in Ethiopia under Haile Selassie in 67 for a year and then 
I was able to go to high school in Jamaica when he went back to his home country to be special advisor to the prime minister and head of the civil service, also to try and bring in reforms there too in the late 70s and early up to about 80. So after that too, he was a consultant for various places. So that I think really kind of informed me in terms of living in different places and sitting out on the balcony when he would be talking about um, behind the closed doors, what was happening in government, what you just read about in the newspapers, he'd be sitting chatting or discussing with friends or colleagues out on the veranda. Right? And my little 16 year old self would be sitting there taking it all in. Right. So again, talk about old world, new world. I remember coming back from Jamaica when I was 18, I guess, or 19. And being on the plane flying into Toronto and looking out onto the sea of concrete as we were driving down the 401 back to our house and thinking like, oh, cold and separate. This is a kid. This is never having read anything about it, but just remembering the sense of community that we had in Jamaica, just being everything smaller, everything more down to earth. Mm. Um so that was, I think, formative for me in terms of old and new, although I would never have articulated that at the time. At that that so, way, but... No, no, not at all. Um, but, but now I see it. There was something about that old sense of community, which, again, in, in you know, driving through um, industrial parks and suburbs, <laughs> you can just feel it is quite different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So after that, it sort of, I guess, um, significantly... Um, I uh, lived in Cambridge, Oxford for four years while my husband was doing his, his um, DPhil in philosophy education, and then Cambridge University for four years where I was doing my doctorate in philosophy education, um, having actually done a music degree first and then a master's in education. So wow. that's kind of how I went there. So again, starting off as a pretty creative person. Um, in music and then into education and then becoming more sort of philosophical that way. Um, so I'm not sure if that helps how does that in inform terms of where you? I'm coming from. No, I wanted folks to hear how deeply dipped you are in this sort of the, the upper crust of educational conversation, how deeply traveled you are, and then how Canadian you sort of are as a way to inform all of these folks that, that like this conversation. I, I noticed that when people talk about education on our channel, it's just a natural, it's, it's a, it's a deeply interesting topic for people. Um, Cause we've all done it. It's one reason being a teacher is such a pain in the butt because everybody knows the classroom and they think they all know how to teach because they had one, you know, a teacher at some point. So, here you are, though, and, and you, you've you sort of wound your way into this, this to me, like a unique position to talk about the, the big ideas. And so here, here's one of the big ideas is education is either captured by the culture or often leads the culture into a type of way of seeing. And how do you see it in Canada? Are the schools, and I know you're teaching younger kids, but are the schools the edge of the spear of what we might call postmodernism, or are they being informed by it? How do you see it? I have always thought that um, education follows the cultural trend, although they do claim with some justification to be creating um, new minds for the next generation. Hmm. So in terms of behind the trend, I think unless it was accepted socially and politically what they wanted to do, they wouldn't be able to do it because they are funded by the government. They're funded by taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't just say, we're doing this thing that nobody wants us to do, which is why I think, uh, so that's the first thing. Um, but the second thing is now in particular, I think that um, I think that split that we often hear about from other commentators about it's a class, but really about the political and educated elite and everybody else. <laughs> I think there's real tension now between mm. those two groups, the upper educated elite, who I think are mostly in that what we would call woke 
um, kind of environment, like very politically progressive, very um, disintegrating, very dismissive of tradition, very self, a lot of the self-loathing that goes on, goes on in that upper level. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think, and again, they've all been educated through our universities, and I'm sure you've you've heard a lot about this, how it is the universities educating our teachers and then the teachers going out and educating our children, right? So in that sense, those ideas do flow down into the society. It is education leading the way for that change. Mm. However, um, I do think that previously it was much more the large body. There was consensus, and even as societies change, that consensus sort of remained uniform, even as it was changing slowly, Mm -hmm. and therefore education followed. Now, I think with the tension between the two, where education is representing those elite views, um, you may have heard of Rob Henderson talking about luxury beliefs. I think he's exactly right on with that, and that those are just beliefs of the privileged or upper classes, the wealthy, um, beliefs that they have that give themselves social status amongst each other, but the consequences of which, if they're bad ideas, never affect them. They affect the poor. Yeah. All right. Is... So they, they never have the consequences of their own ideas and they're content to feel virtuous about positive these things and the status that comes with with that, but not ever facing the consequences of that. That whole idea of, you know, marriage is archaic, who needs marriage? But eighty percent of the upper level elite once they leave college, they get married while at the same time saying, oh, you know, marriage is an old fashioned thing. I think everyone should have a choice. There should be no stigma not getting married, yet they are still getting married. And then that trickles down. And the people who need the most security and safety, particularly the women who need the most security and safety from a stable long term relationship are the ones who, oh, there's no stigma, we don't need to get married. and But they face the consequences of the poverty that comes with single motherhood and, and, and the the effects on the boys who are raised, particularly in single motherhood. So all that kind of stuff, that's that's a luxury belief thing. So to answer your question, no, this in is Canada, this is very interesting. Okay. in Canada, I think that we are seeing... Um, education kind of trying to be the cutting edge as it always thinks of itself as being leading down into more and more of these, which we can talk about later as really progressive anti-Western ideas. And then sort of, I do think that is changing the culture, Mm. but it has already been changed into a certain, in a certain sense by that elite who were always predominant in the culture anyway. They are the politicians. They are the educators. They yeah. are the 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 um the the engine of the economics anyway, right? Right. So I don't know if that answers the question. I think it's sort of like this, but now you can really see it in the tension between the two, where regular people are saying, "You're teaching what? You're teaching our kids what? We're supposed to, you know?" Agree we see with that pushback what? in the states. Big time. Oh yeah, and way, way more. It sort of happens mm-hmm. state by state, where there's more, mm-hmm. we're a little more decentralized, well, quite a bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, you've established an interesting idea, um, which is that which flows down and maybe might be trendy, and sort of um, born out of a desire for equity and equality, and it all sounds pretty. Those ideas, those deep ideas that blow up tradition actually hurt the poor. I I, I fundamentally agree with you. A lot of people made those arguments coming out. um, I think it was um, the senator from New York um, who was actually deeply uh, responsible for a lot of the poverty programs. He always said, it's not Donahue. Um, He's a famous politician from New York in the 70s. But he said, yeah, the... The sins of the elite do not manifest in the culture of the elite. They manifest in the, in the right in the da- daily lives of the poor, uh, which is a fascinating concept. And I do, I think, I agree with you. So what? So here's a question: What should be the role of public education then? Could it ever be that there's wise enough people within education to understand what you just said? And so what they're trying to actually do is 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 sort of reduce the damage? Could could that be a a role of public education? Could you imagine? (laughs) 
to reduce the damage of the political trend of the time, yeah. the social trend. Of the- <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's hopeful. I it's think- hopeful. Let's be hopeful. It doesn't happen yeah. though, right? It's not happening. Um, it, it all depends. It all depends who's in charge and what the ruling ideology is, right? That, that's it. Bottom line. And every century and every society will have a ruling ideology. Yes. And that's what will be in your education system, period. So if you're lucky enough to live under, who is it, Marcus Aurelius, you know, the philosopher king, okay, mm-hmm. you might get a good, you know, a great edge. If you happen to live, well, that that's all I need to say, right? So it all really depends. So let me bring you back to basics on this one. The question that really got me going at Cambridge to really think about what I wanted to write about. It's just that really, really basic question. What is education? Yeah. What's it for? Perfect. Right? Because what people don't actually, and when I when you ask most people, what is what is education? Well, it's a school, and the kids go to school, and they learn this, and they learn that, right? They really do tend to default to say education is stuff you teach kids in a school or a university, whatever it is. But you have to go back even more basic than that. You have to go back to, okay, once you say education, you say educating who, okay, educating a person, a young person perhaps, from one thing to become or teaching them towards something else, right? Moving them from here to there. And once you say moving from here to there, you have to have the question, well, What's so much better about there, (laughs) where, and what's so much better about there? So as soon as you say moving or changing or giving somebody something, you have to say, well, you have to be going towards something better, right? Right. So once you bring in the word better, whether you like it or not, you've brought in the word good. What is good? What is, and once you brought in the word good, you've brought in what is the good, the ultimate Mm -hmm. good, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, again, what is the ultimate good that we want these young people to, to move towards, right? And again, there are so many versions of what that could be. Most people default to whatever is sort of, again, the ruling political ideology. Um, but really, until you answer that question, how do you really know what you're doing and why you're doing it? Right? So, so in Canada, is the ultimate good from what you can tell? In the education system there. Uh, this I'm talking about what we would call through high school. We can add college, but let's 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 do primary and secondary education. Do you guys call it that in Winnipeg? Yes. Yeah, you know? we do. Okay. So I think I would argue the American, the quintessential good as per as designed for and within the, the educational, you know system is utility. So to be useful is the point of your 12 years through age 18. Do you think, did, did I get it right? Am I, am I saying the answer right according to your construction um, that you just gave us about you know how education works? And if I got it right, is that the right answer? Well, that's, that's interesting too, because utility or maybe how do you fit into the liberal political order? How do you become a good citizen? How do you, you know that kind of thing, economically contribute. So I think, yes, although it's interesting because I was listening to one of your previous podcasts where um, one of your guests describes sort of like public system in that way as, well, it's just purely how do you fit into the political order or the economics, um, sort of kind of utility mm-hmm, in, in the way mm-hmm, that you're saying. Mm-hmm. And that he was talking about educating for virtue, right, instead mm-hmm. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking, actually, the people who are setting up the education system now, and I'm talking about the influence now of of the most current political ideology, they're very much bringing back, leaning back on this idea of virtue, be a good person. Interesting. And and who would argue with that? (laughs) Nobody would argue that. It's very old world. It's very classical education. Except... Except that what defined the virtue, okay? (laughs) So in their mind, someone who's virtuous is someone who cares about the the climate or about the earth, what have you. Someone who recognizes their own um, worth or value. 
Oh, the hidden, oh, hidden biases. biases. Oh, oh, very nice. Yeah, very nice. somebody who recognizes their own hidden biases, someone who is recognizes their own privilege, if it's appropriate, someone who is out there to lift up the poor. And again, who, wouldn't, who would not argue with that except in terms of how you lift up the poor by squashing down everybody else, right? So there's, so again, yes, there's this whole thing of like, we're going to make virtuous people and it's so strong in the system now. I'll give you an example. I don't want to name too many. I hope it's not naming too, too many names. I took a whole batch of grade fours, fives and sixes this morning to the symphony and they have this fantastic program they have concerts just for students and they build a whole show with student performers and with professional actors and dancers that, that perform with the symphony. They give us an entire teacher's guide to go through the music beforehand so that the children are familiar with the music, um, building on skills and listening and all that kind of thing. Mm. Then they go to this icing on the cake is the concert. Well, they rehashed one that they did maybe 12 years ago. And this one, they had gone back in the future and had gone through different musical stages, you know, and come up to the present. And of course, each stage was um, associated with a particular piece of music that they played. Well, they reframed the whole thing to be back in the day when people didn't really care about the earth. There was this fellow who was blah, 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 and he did this. And then after that, they were, and so all the way through, all, and then of course, they came up to Indigenous, which in Canada, you can't do anything without incorporating indigenous values indigenous um reconciliation all that that they are they are our black lives matter up here mm -hmm. and um so incorporating all of that so again it was very obvious very much focal point virtue of a very particular kind right and mm -hmm. a very particular content right um so yes, I think they're bringing back virtue big time, but it's just a question of really that might be a contested might be a contested view of what virtue actually is and what 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 it accomplishes. Like I mean virtue only matters if it actually makes the right or a good difference in the world, yeah. not just any difference, right? So then that's a whole other thing too. So again, that's exactly. that's something to discuss, which is not being discussed. We have a lot of grumbling and people saying, mm, do I really have to be the person who stands up and says that to the kids? Or do I have to advocate for this thing, which I'm really quite indifferent to, or just sort of sympathetic to, but it's not my hill to die on. So we're getting grumbling about that from teachers, but nobody would dare stand up and say, oh, Actually, I feel like you would. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm getting there. You have, I have actually. You have that spirit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I've already been cut from one planning committee for our whole division, partly, I think, because I may have made comments <laughs> to the effect of oh, asking questions like, who does this actually benefit, actually? <laughs> well, no. let's do this funny um, question for a second. Our. The size of our podcast protects you because maybe no one will see this. But, <laughs> right. yeah, but what so far in this conversation, you know, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being you're super fired, one being everyone at school, your school hears it and you're, nothing happens to you. How does it feel so far this conversation? Does it feel like you might, someone might say something to you like, hey, Dawn, really? Let's take it easy there. Would you get in, quote, in trouble in Canada for this conversation? Um, here's the thing. I think if it was my colleagues, people who teach beside me, they go, oh, yeah, because I have had these kind of conversations of course, <laughs> with my that's colleagues, right. other that's teachers. Right. Yeah. So they would say, hmm, yeah, it makes sense. It may not be my thing. If I think if any one of the, the political leaders or the administration would say, oh, I knew it. She's a troublemaker. Or she's got very odd ideas or she's a far right something because that's always the answer, right? If you have any questions about any of this, you have to be a far right horrible person or something. Um, that's, that's the sling. Uh, so I think, yes, I could get into I'm not, I would just be again, left off the next committee right you're just <laughs> right? gonna be i'll just be marked slowly ostracized over time absolutely well, absolutely it's happening about, already so but your jamaican self doesn't protect you in some way against some of this stuff <laughs> i know i'm really interested in this oh uh, people ask that all the time and i see it with other people all the time other people in my position being a brown person who doesn't actually 
toe the line with the, the right attitudes. And that is, there's two options. One, I am so immersed in racism that I have internalized it right? <laughs> and don't realize it. Oh. Number two, I'm a traitor to my own race. I'm an Oreo cookie. I'm taking the white man's position or whatever it is supposed to be. Um, so there are easily ways to diss me as a brown person for not having the current political ideology. Quite, quite easy, because there's always some way to psycho psychologize this, that I have been brainwashed into saying the things that I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I've been watching you speak, and I'm appalled at how brainwashed you are. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, you know, you have to watch what you wish for in this world. And um, we do this. One is I think we create great conversations. And one day a whole bunch of people might start paying attention. But it's like the genie, you know, You're like, be careful because you start wishing for stuff. What you, what you really should wish for maybe is that when you go to bed, you wake up. <laughs> that's why that's why our Orthodox prayers are like, I'm kind of about to die, so I'm going to ask for some forgiveness because it's the image of death. And so, if what if we could all just stay in that space where the, we just hope for the next day? Like, you know, mm. it, it's one of the problems with the internet is is people like me and really everybody that just puts a microphone in front of them. They, I think we think we can affect things. I think it's hilarious. I think I think if we just get the right amount of people to watch. It'll all change. That's not ever, that doesn't, that's not it. To me, that's, that's a, that's a very French revolution. That's, a, a, that's, you know, the Jacobins. That's how they thought. And, uh, I don't, I don't want to fall into that though. Sometimes I think we do. Although on the other hand, if I could respond. Yeah, please I think do. Some, please do. Something is happening, John, and you're playing a little part in that. Now, I don't know if we mentioned it before in our other conversations. I've kind of come through the Peterson Pajot pipeline. That's yes, kind of have. how I found yes, you. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. <laughs> how I found your podcast, in mm -hmm. fact, mm -hmm. right? And then now recently, especially because a lot of the topics that you've been covering is like, oh, yeah. So I think, although it's true, you, yeah, I'm old enough now to say, oh, I'm not going to make that uh, mark on the world that I always thought I would. Mm. That's okay. But if you are doing that in your little circle and in your little space, mm. I've you've seen it grow. You've seen since COVID how that whole, um, as Vander Klee likes to call it, that little corner of the internet, that whole awakening in another sense, like, oh, we're seeing it. Jonathan Pajot, like all that, mm. those kind of people, anything connected to that, Paul King's North, uh, Martin Shaw, you've interviewed those guys. It's happening. It is spreading and it is growing. And I think that you can feel really good that you are, if you want to call it a small part, but a part of that thing that is making a difference, like it yeah. is growing throughout the world. I really do think that. So um, I, I, I yeah. couldn't agree more. Number one. Number two is, is people pick up tools. So where people invent tools, other humans pick them up, whether they be glasses so they can read or a mouse pad or picking up the tool of the internet is not really the problem. The problem is, is it's a different type of tool than we're mostly used to in that it, it, it interacts with us differently than most tools. Most tools are more inert. You know what I mean? This this thing has a spiritual sort of under undergirding. And so I, I, I'm with you and I have no problems. And in the end, you know, it's too complicated for us to figure out with our brains. Um, but the spirit, you're right. The intuition is, is that my conscience tells me it's good. It's a good thing to have this conversation with you. It's a good thing to talk with Martin Shaw and, and Paul Kingsnorth, whom I love, love. It's a good thing. Now, weird things happen too. Um, fandom is a thing. It's really wild. Oh. Um, oh. We interview a lot of people that go work for us at First Things Foundation. And because our podcast is it's successful in its own way, weird conversations happening. You know, I'm sitting in a teeny, guys, I'm in this teeny little room that was going to be for my mom as she got old. And it just 
looks like it looks because we're trying to fake you out. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, this thing is helping me to reach people about our work. It's helping me to find out about Canada and Canadian education. And now let's go into the next set of questions because I got a couple more for you. But I love that you said that. And I need it. And people who are on the internet staring into the screen, we need it because it's good to be reminded by human beings, even through the screen that, you know, we we're together in some level. So it's beautiful. I thank you for that. I really do. Here's another thing. Um, Canada is known to South Carolinians where I live as like really evil. Like <laughs> it's not all that. It can't be, but what is it right now? What is Canada? Well, you know, that's so interesting because, of course, I'm listening to podcasts all the time by Americans and British people. And they're saying the same things like, oh, well, you know, Canada's a write off and Canada's just mm -hmm. down the drain, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And being in the middle of it, I can say it is a tidal wave of this political ideology I was talking about, absolutely being submerged in this. But then that whole idea of, you know, these people, they just want to control you. These people, they just want a status. They just want all this other stuff. What I'm seeing is a whole lot of people who are really well-intentioned, who, without maybe previous, or maybe after, actually, I can't even say without church, because some of these people are Christian as well. They have sensed or begin to grasp this thing that they can hold on to, to make a difference in the world, to give meaning and purpose mm. to their life mm. and to do what seems perfectly obviously the right thing to do by raising up the poor and the dispossessed, right? Raising up the marginal, those that have been excluded through race or gender or being an immigrant, not being, not being an insider. So this in and out thing and people have grasped this as something to really put their energies into to make a difference in the world. Okay. Now, can again, Canadians, we are very, we can't even say, hardly say it anymore, but we are a very fundamentally British society yeah, up until, yeah, yeah. up until 20 years ago, because we were developed. We, Canada was built by the British settlers that came here uh, except for those large pockets like Quebec, which were the French. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So again, we're known for being like quiet, deferential, decent. A lot of the things that people talk about the British traditionally as being right, mm -hmm. moderate, all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Funny. So I think the British. Funny. Funny. <laughs> so we have this, and again, we have been now caught up in that whole wave of anti-Western, self-loathing. Everything in our past was just vicious colonialism and i think a lot of and again i another thing i was thinking of the other day too is that most of us except for the wave of immigrants maybe who are still immigrants rather than me first generation most of us in north america have inherited privilege from the work of our parents, whether it's even my parents being immigrants or even five generations ago, ten generations, we have this level of affluence that we inherited. And I think that, again, again, fundamentally Christian values, right? You know, Tom Holland's dominion, the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have this sense of, we being collectively, of guilt, that we have so much, and now that we know that so many people have so little. So the combination of uninherited wealth, like just prosperity that we were born into, plus looking around at devastation, plus, um, um, oh, how shall I put it? I think also the influx of alternative uh, worldviews, in the last 20 years, causing us to be very uncertain about what we believe. And especially again, you know, the, they call it the death of Christianity, all that. So all of these factors coming in to make people feeling very guilty about the privilege they have, not really having anything to rest on um, spiritually, and therefore turning everything 
to this political yeah, focus. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Everything becomes political. And you've heard this before, that without without God, then everything becomes, there's another God. And if without church, there it becomes political. Yeah, but people right. have that need to for a larger, something larger than themselves, right? That, that, so Okay, keep going. Keep going. Okay. I was just going to say that in Canada, I think those things have all converged to have a whole, and again, mostly affluent people in positions of influence who feel the need to make up for past wrongs as a stamp of virtue and to show how much they care about those that don't have and to show that I think of it as it's two types of people who, who become really woke uh, and it's all connected to the white guilt thing. Um, the first are the ones who feel the white guilt, like I'm white and privileged and you're not just because I was born white and that's not right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And my, and all the way, and, and I, I got my privilege because my ancestors killed off your ancestors and that's not right. Okay. So there's the white guilt. And then the second group, in my opinion, is the people who say, and I'm not them. <laughs> I, I, I am not one of those people OK, I just want you to know that I recognize my bias and I recognize my sins and I recognize all the things. So I'm not somebody a who's going to be put into right. a, a repentant. Uh, right. right. Uh -huh. Exactly. So I think it's a huge motivation and it's a virtuous motivation. But I think it is fundamentally mis misguided because they don't see that the policies that they have chosen to bring about this great utopia are actually not based on human nature at yeah, all. Yeah, there you and, go. And his, yeah. Beautiful. And historically flawed, very historically flawed. Uh, so, yeah. I, it, that was such an excellent sort of overview of what's happening in Canada and probably, and here too. But what I want to really get at is you notice that it all starts with anthropology. Like we can think, fix our monkey selves by just being smarter monkeys. And there's like this delinquent approach where they don't they don't dig into nature, the nature of man. The the evolutionary explanation of our nature is just it's just weak. The data about our cells and you know our bodies is not bad. Who doesn't like all that data about, you know, how our sinewy muscles work and why they work that way? But the actual study of nature, the actual study of things unseen is weak. And so I like what you said. I would believe in a woke set of policies if we were what they think we are. <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly. you know what I mean? Yeah, it, on paper, it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like if I am just, you know, an ambling animal that has desires and I need to satiate them and you're going to help. Like when they say you're going to have universal income, my animal self is like, universal income, that sounds great. <laughs> like I eat whenever I want to eat. Like, okay. <laughs> but I'm not that thing. As Dostoevsky says, you, you can give it, human beings every single thing they've ever wanted. And by the way, he, it's so true what he says because he says, and they'll still break shit. Because, <laughs> because they can't help it. Because it's not our nature to p be perfect, and and all you got to do is look at royal families throughout history. You, they have mm. everything they want, every 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 everything. And by the third generation, every kid's a freak. You know what mm. I mean? Every the, the children are, are this, nuts. You could say the same thing about dynasties. Any corporation that was built by one guy's hard work, third generation in, Cooked. they lose it. Right? It's everything. It's not just royalty. It's everybody. So now this brings me to something else that I, I hope gets down to the core here for you. I was just looking at this again, so I hope I get this all right because it's been a while. Petrarch was a, a poet, philosopher, writer, artist in the 1300s, and he was the first person to talk about the self. Previous to that, mm. classically, it was the soul. That's right. So why does that matter? Well, there's this thing that um, Plato or Socrates refers to as psychogogia, which is the leading or drawing of the soul. Mm. Towards what, right? Well, in the ancient view, there was a cosmos. There was a, a unifying soul or spirit. 
And each one of our individual souls, the purpose of it was to be drawn out from where we are and find our place in the overall cosmos. Wow, wow. So, so we were something, we were not, okay, so after Petrarch and then Renaissance solidified this in educational theory, it became the self. And um, rumor has it that Petrarch changed that because he was looking around at all the turmoil in Europe and he was finding it hard to just really justify this idea of the goodness, the cosmos, the, you know, uh, God drawing souls out um, and he saw all of this around him. So he thought, well, maybe let's not look at that big picture because I don't, I don't see that working. Let's just look inward. So he turned inward and called it the self, like your individual self. And then it became that the point of the self in terms of education was to become perfected mm. in itself. And you hear that all the time, realize your, realize your potential, right? So instead of your your essence or your soul, um, your mind, spirit, everything, finding its place in the larger cosmos, you're a small part of that larger thing. It is now you need to be perfected into this individual thing, right? And there's perfection to be found there if you just work on it hard enough. Well, of course, that is just fundamentally a different way of looking, like you're saying, at the human being and mm -hmm. a human nature, mm. right? So... Yeah, I think that's maybe something to think about it as well, that idea of uh, not being self-contained and all that, that sort of after hundreds of years, what that turned into, and going back to the idea of cosmos, which is why I love the idea, and you, I've seen it all around too, about um, all the people who are trying to, in our North American society, re-enchant or yeah. rediscover the enchantment in the cosmos, which is what you're talking about too, right? Yeah. And then I discovered that for myself as a Protestant home church, like totally iconoclastic upbringing, right? Where it's functional, what they call is functional materialism or functional atheism, right. right? So saying words like angels and heaven, they were just words and heaven was around somewhere. I didn't know where, like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to think about. So that whole idea of re-enchanting the cosmos and thinking of it as cosmos rather than our new word universe Right. Yeah, um, yeah. That might be one way to go as well, which I think is, again, already happening. I think it's one of those things that is, um, like I was talking about before, people's awareness now that, that our flat materialism, we, we are at the end of that now. We can't really sustain. Uh, I yeah, have to so. tell you, I was at a table at the restaurant uh, being Tamada, and by the end of these dinners, people are sitting around sometimes if we're outside, we smoke a cigar or something. <laughs> and there was a functional atheist there for whatever that means. He was, he, he told me that was a phrase for himself. He's like, I don't just day to day believe in anything, but he said this and he wasn't a dummy. He said, but the days when I could just make fun of Christians is over. People don't really let me do that or, or it's just not cool anymore. And I, then we, we proceeded to make fun of like, you know, like evangelical or like, like hardcore Southern Christians. But what, what he meant was, is an I it was, we were joking, but what, what he meant to say is, is now it's actually just humor and it's not actually aimed to destroy anybody. But there was a moment in culture, especially when I was coming up in the eighties and nineties and two thousands, it was meant to shut you up. It was meant to be like, you're a fool. Now it's like, I don't really sure I even know this stuff to be true anymore. Evolution might, maybe that's kind of how he was talking and at the table mm -hmm. over and over with, it's a public setting. You know, I, I have to agree with you. It's happening where yeah. the, the vocabulary yeah. is changing. Yeah. And even that whole, that period you're talking about of the new atheists, right? Mm -hmm. Where it was just chic to be really disparaging. And even the new atheists themselves, Richard Dawkins and, uh, Sam Harris, mm -hmm. it's no longer like this is trash. I mean, even Sam Harris has sort of um, embraced kind of some kind of spirit spirituality kind of thing, right? Yeah, I, and I think it's it's really true that that period of, of vitriolic resistance to Christianity is kind of waning, and now people are saying, and it might have something to do too with they were pulling out the roots of young people oh, this, who were in churches, right? In churches and being very dis 
disillusioned with churches, especially North America. But now that I think the, the roots are pulled out, we have a whole new two generations of young people who've never stepped inside a church, who have no idea what it's about. So again, they haven't been inoculated against Christianity like a lot of those people were during the new atheist time. So Mm. I think you're right. This is a new phase now where people are saying, okay, I I don't have so much to hate about it anymore because I'm not, I don't know anything much about it, but yeah, clearly and that's the other thing too, the fact that the new atheists had nothing to offer as a positive vision. It was all tear down, tear down. And I think that's happening with our new political progressive gotcha. e- ideology as well. It's tear down, tear down, tear, tear, down, tear down. down, but you don't hear much other than this utopia kind of thing, assuming, uh, anyway, well, that's another thing this, too. Can, it, let me yeah. ask you this. Is this the hardest thing? Because you know your stuff and you know, you studied education, you're in it. Is this the hardest thing? For me, this was the hardest thing when we started uh, started high school, when I was teaching in the South Bronx, when I was teaching in Harlem. Hmm. It's not the system. There was a New York State, New York City Board of Ed, whatever. I wrote a whole novel about that. By the way, I want everybody to read my novel. It's free, kind of, on Substack. But check it out. The hardest thing was, is there was a building and human beings in it. And at any given time, there were 45 or 100 teachers or in our little school, I think we had you know 18 high school teachers. The hardest thing was to not get everybody on the same page. It was get people to believe there could be a page. Um, relativism will destroy every school that ever has existed because every school will default to utilitarianism. I just want these kids to graduate. Hey, we did it. And I think that period in school has actually ended too. I think in the next 20 years, schools will have to sit around and go, this is what we believe. I know every school has a mission statement, but just read those things. They're, they're maddening. They, they're just word. They don't say anything. They don't say anything about the transcendent. They don't say anything about, you know, profound, about anthropology. What's a human? They don't say anything. So is it, that's, that's my hardest thing for a school. What's your hardest thing for a school? The hardest thing that a school master has to do within the, the walls of any particular building called the school. Hmm. Well, first of all, I think that um, the force of this new ideology, I call it new because it's maybe, actually it's probably only about five to five years, a little bit more, maybe 10, that is subsuming the drive. And again, if you're in a school, not as the headmaster, but even as a headmaster in a school division, you are taking your, um, it, your orders from the higher ups. Mm. So you don't establish the ethos in your school. We hear it all the time from our, um, our principal, our admin. It's like, well, this is a, a policy in the division now, and we're here to implement the policy in the division. They say it and like we're that. going this way. Oh, absolutely. And and everybody knows it. And to the point where it was said to us, this is where our division is going. We really believe in this. This is where the train is going. And if you're not on the train, you need to maybe find another track. It, it's that. So again, it's this whole ethos is in place. It's not school by school. It is, this is how we do it. Now, again, you'll have some differences between communities, right? But in terms of the overall ethos, like what are we doing this for? And again, I will come back to, there is that strong sense now of, okay, we want good citizens. That's always been there too. We want good citizens. I see. see. So that, that, that is the cult. That's the highest part of the cult, the good citizen thing good citizen, a virtuous person and a good citizen to save the world from where we're going now. Some Mm -hmm. of the problem is, is that the good citizen conversation for way too long, really post-World War II, at least in the United States, was productive citizen. They kind of went together. And Mm. and it was, Mm. to me, I was rejecting that in the 90s, Mm. which is, Mm -hmm. you just mean, if they get a good job, we did a good job? Mm -hmm. Maybe. That's still there. But again, I think that whole thing of virtue is is very, very high on the agenda in, in many, many places. It, it may have it's taken just, the place of that of that produ- productivity conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Because we're now getting rid of exams. We're getting rid of standardized testing. It's all about self-esteem. It's all about feeling good about yourself and loving each other. 
uh, it's so interesting because so much of us, you know, they, they talk about it all the time, the flower that's cut, right? Sure. Uh, we're, we're existing on the fumes of Christianity. Yep, this yep. is so fundamentally Christian and so hostile to Christianity at the same time. That's what I was going to say about before when you were saying like, oh, you know, there's no transcendence. Like, oh, we don't talk about transcendence because then we would have to be acknowledging something about religion. And we don't want to do that yes. unless, of course, unless, of course, it's the indigenous um, religions, in which case that's OK. Those are all over our walls. Why? As they said, because these are more universal, you know, love, courage, honesty. And I'm thinking, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? interesting. We're doing this because it's universal, but the same words in a Christian context. Oh, uh, nope, nope. <laughs> you mean like St. John, God is love, like right at the beginning? Uh, it's like insane. Yeah. It, <laughs> we, we know what that really, is. That's just the yeah. replacement of one ruling group for another. I get that. Absolutely. I, I always Absolutely. tell my friends who, like Uncle Seth, who comes on the show, by the way, guys, Uncle Seth, he's coming back. It's been a while. But Uncle Seth will always tell me, you guys are just mad because there's a new sheriff in town. <laughs> but I always want to go, well, I'm not one of you guys in that conversation. I, I'm, a, I'm a weird Orthodox guy. But you're not wrong. I tell him he's not wrong. There's a new mm -hmm. sheriff in town. The problem is the sheriff seems drunk, like they don't know where they're going. <laughs> they seem like they're wandering around. Like, it just feels like one emotional moment to the next. That's how it feels. True. Yeah. And the biggest problem I see is, again, because they're caught up emotionally. Where was I just reading about that, about being dominated by emotions? And again, I know we don't want to go the other end and say completely rational. We're not enlightenment junkies, you know, but... Mm -hmm. That well, idea, Don. Can I call you? By the way, are you your Doctor Don? Aren't you? I am Doctor. Yes, Don. you're Doctor Don. <laughs> yes, I'm Dr. I, I've Don. always called you Don. I'm such a jerk. I'm a I'm a well, I'm a woman hater, obviously. So nobody calls me Doctor Don. I'm nobody. calling you Doctor Don. Doctor <laughs> okay, Don. Do it. Do it. <laughs> uh, shoot, now I just forgot what I was going to say. Literally, <laughs> totally, all the way, guys. As my wife always says, you're like two years away from a hospital bed, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I literally forgot. Don't hate me. I'm, I, I forgot. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Oh, it'll come back to you. Yeah. <laughs> it will. It will. Oh, so what I was saying was being driven by emotional, although we're not anti, we're not going to go the whole rationality rules enlightenment thing. That's right. Um, but being driven by this emotional, oh, there's just so much. I just, I just, it's such an interesting time to be alive. Maybe it always is if you're paying attention. <laughs> it's probably always an always. interesting time to be alive. Always. But this whole feminization of the public space right the whole morphing of the private and the public mm -hmm. where now we have all the virtues of uh, femininity and womanhood that flourish in the private sphere now being put into the public sphere this whole we can't offend anybody everybody has to feel equally good equity I don't love any one of my kids more than the other. Right? And even if they're, you know, an axe murderer, I will always love them, blah, blah, blah. That whole blah, thing, blah, blah. right? Or, or, that, or you know, like, um, oh, Johnny, you fell off your bike. Come give me a hug. Dad says, come on, boy, get up, get going. You can do it. So that whole, that whole tension between the feminine and the masculine, the mom and the dad, and the whole feminine thing that has seeped now into culture where we're all – consumed and cancel culture cancel culture is a feminine version of men at war right men would go out and just mm. kill each other women will eliminate you from the group right which is so there's just so that, much going on there there's like yeah that's accurate yeah i raised so four the, daughters yeah and no one's gonna <laughs> tell me otherwise yeah so the, and then put let's just put the women in charge okay all right. And then there's some many good things that come with that. But then again, you don't know human nature. You're not paying attention that there needs to be balance, right? Go right back to Aristotle. There needs to be the balance, be right? Balanced. Uh, so there's that. Um, and again, I think this new ideology, right, is very feminine that way, led emotionally, led by how you feel, how you're perceived to feel, how, you know, this, this um, microaggressions, like microaggressions, right? It's something like that. Those kind of subtleties are very feminine things no, right that's so, interesting that's interesting. so there's to me there's like there's their whole of that and how now our whole society after working towards this for maybe 50 years or so 
how it's been more captured than that with that than not. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, I mean, the whole sexual revolution, and we could talk about that too. um, That whole thing about freeing women to be more like men, right? (laughs) That that whole thing. It's just, oh, it's just all so interesting. And then put on top of this, this ideology. um, Yeah, where, you know, Anyway, so let I just think there's you, so much Let me ask you this, because you're, you're a unique thinker, and we're going to have you back for sure. No, I, I, love, I love the way you think, and your expertise is helpful for my audience. And, um, and next time, we'll, we'll get really deep into um, sort of what you learned from the old world known as Jamaica, which isn't really the old world, but we'll talk about that differently. But I, not right now, but this is my question to you. You're dealing with, and well, I would argue, a whole series of big ideas that you have to fit into your your you know, your know person as a teacher, and you, you relate to kids in lots of unique ways and unique with unique ideas. And I know that you're brilliant in the classroom, but let me ask you this. What you were brought up on spiritually is some some type of reform theology, right? Your parent your parents were were religious, and I want to hear about it. Is that theology able to hold right now in within you? So I would argue as an Orthodox Christian, it, it's it's broken now. It's broken. Like the Western reform theology is broken, and you can just look around. It's it's. De- How about inside of you? Is it able to hold within you? Are you still um, a reformed Christian of some sort who goes to the altar of John Calvin or whatever? What are you doing with yourself? Hmm. How does it work? <laughs> True confessions <laughs> of yeah. uh, of an Orthodox adjacent. That's right. Oh, there it is. So this is <laughs> it. I am. I am Orthodox adjacent. And again, Peterson, Pajot, Papa. Um, okay, I will just be real personal about this. 13 years ago, my husband left our family. So it was at that point where it's like, ooh, all the time. We had a very conservative, very traditional Christian homeschooling family. And it was at that point when I said, okay, I need to really think about what I actually believe and what was true, what was rock and what was sand, because all of this just dissolved into sand, right? So it started me on a personal journey just to think about and discover what was true and what I thought, um, how, how close that was to what was true. So it's been like 13 years, but the first 10 years in particular was a journey towards opening my mind to theology, to other ways of thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I would start with some very prominent, I would say Protestant, Tim Keller was a, a, a lifesaver oh, in the first okay. five years. Okay. But even again, it's probably because coming from my very anti-intellectual, uh, very material bound group, he was at least an intellectual who delved into bigger questions. So that opened things up for me. And then from there, it was to others. I started looking back at some of the older, maybe classical writers, not yet um, church fathers. That's that's sort of where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then again, hitting that pipeline into Jonathan Peugeot and the whole idea of re-enchanting the world. So for me personally, I'm in the process of trying to come back to faith through another door. Not a set of propositions, as Viviki would say. So it's just like, I believe this and I believe that. I say the words and then good. But trying to find God not in a personal emotional experience, which I am, unfortunately, I've, I, I don't know if I've had because either... I've never had one. I've never heard the voice or never had, you know, felt felt the, the, the vision. Or I have out in the field with my dog just breathing in the beauty yeah. and just yeah. being happy to be alive. Was that God speaking? Because the atheist down the street says they felt the same thing too, right? So without their experience of God, but I heard someone said something beautiful the other day, said, well, they were experiencing God. They just didn't recognize it. Well, so again, I- intellectually. Yeah, but they right. did recognize so, it because that's why they said, "Yeah, that was nice. That happened to me." They they mm-hmm. felt it. I don't like that mm-hmm. phraseology, but they did. Mm-hmm. That's why you can even agree on it because they yeah, felt or, what well, you felt. Well, I don't know if they felt what I felt. They might have felt, "Oh, what a lovely day!" and "Oh, 
isn't the world wonderful? But whereas I might have felt, this is creation. This is God speaking to me. That's a very different feeling. I might right? argue with you. Okay. I might, oh, good. I might say this. I know I'm not good at it. My, my brother's really good at it, but I'm not so good at it. <laughs> yep. I might say this. You thought it. You both felt it. But mm. you thought a set of words that leads you to a different rational conclusion. But you both actually felt, and this is what I mean, goodness. And you both recognize it as good. Whatever came next, your explanation of it is creation and the, the breath of God or whatever. Whatever comes next is an intellectual understanding of something more base, something mm. something more right brain. I, I, I was mm. listening to McKill Chris recently and, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I've started to worry that he's right. And, and we really shouldn't read those books. Uh, Which books? His books? His books. <laughs> and the reason is it's, a, it's the left brain telling us about the right brain. His books are left brain. So that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it's like, hold, hold, hold on a minute. It's very interesting. Um, you know, Eugene Vodolatskin tried to write this book, Loris, and it's really, it's what it really is, is the union of the, it's it's what I believe to be the Holy Spirit in the book, but it's very, it feels very right brainy. In other words, you, you don't understand almost anything that's going on half the time. Have you read Loris? I highly no. recommend it. And the reason you don't understand what's going on is because he really worked hard to stay out of an intellectual understanding of his characters. And, mm. and, and he did that through liturgy. See, he's faithful okay. Orthodox. Right. And that's what Dostoevsky was doing too. And um, yeah. without going on and on about that, the thing I was saying about that atheist you described as having felt goodness, at that moment, it's done. He felt what you felt, and it's both, it's good. Now, what about someone who feels the beauty of the sun and the wind, and they say, this is shit, this is awful, this is evil? I don't know what they, that, that's a, maybe a more interesting question. Mm. What's, what's going on there? Are they mm -hmm. just, are they recognizing a demon? I, I don't know. It's very interesting. I don't think it's mm. for this, this conversation. No, it isn't. I'll just finish by saying that I think it's a really good point you're making. However, there must be that next step into the rational for there to be confession, yeah, uh, confession yeah. of faith, right? But I'll just leave it there. We'll talk about it more um, because then, then everybody would be a default Christian. Everybody would be saved, if you want to call it that way. Um, so... Yes. So oh, but, at this point, yep. Go let's, ahead. But let's go. Okay, come on. We got one more. The reason I'm I'm not <laughs> trying to rush you, but I promised my guys that I would always try to stay under an hour. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be talking to you for the next six hours. <laughs> yeah. But but I I do. So the saved idea. Okay, um, that that is another conversation. You, well, I think <laughs> that's part well, of it. That's part I, of it. I was yeah. telling Justin Briley on my one of my last podcasts, this English Protestant. Yep. I saw it. Yeah. The reason that I really think this is actually important and super relevant to conversations about culture and education and the future is because ultimately what I think people are trying to fix up right now, though they won't use this vocabulary, I'm including Pajot, Peterson, I'm talking about this whole corner of the world. I don't think they know this yet. And I don't want to, I'm breaking news. <laughs> Andrew, put this in the beginning. I'm breaking this news. <laughs> is I don't think they're actually talking about what's happening to culture. I think they're talking about and in retrospect what has happened to christianity and what what has to happen for all of this to make sense eventually is is there has to be a conversation about what is a christian and that conversation is going to go round and round and round and round like i was telling briarly like at mcdonald's i remember when i was a little kid i would put a quarter in this little thing and the quarter would roll 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 it was fun to watch it go plop into the into the you know the jar that has all the money and I don't know how Western society saves itself without having this conversation that ultimately ends in what is the church. I'm not joking about that at all. And I see all of this fighting for what is reality, what is multiplicity. And I've, I hear all these scientific conversations moving eventually to, okay, we're all talking about the same thing, God, and then which God? And then Christians can't just say, the Orthodox call it God, small o. They can't. It's not sufficient. Like, okay, well, Christ died for your sins. 
it's going to end up in that conversation. Now, I, it's possible the tech world takes all this over and there's some giant mega death monster that kills it all. Don't get me wrong. But I think all these conversations are preparations for the actual conversation, which is who is Christ, which demands what is the church. That's what I think. Oh, cool. Cool. <laughs> Can't wait. Because, again, that's part that's part of what I'm what I'm searching for. Right. And uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think what's nice about it too, is that I don't know if you're like me, but I get all caught up in my head right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. And theology, does this make sense? Does that make sense? This does not make sense. Does that mean, you know, domino effect? That's my problem. The domino effect. Yeah, like because if you take it, this one out, or the, the Jenga effect, you take this belief out, the whole thing falls down. Sorry. And I know this church holds on to this set of beliefs, this church overlaps and holds on to this set. But, you know, you can go through and take out those Jenga blocks all over the place. So I'm just at the point where I'm thinking, I need to stop with the Jenga blocks. I need to just put it into my body and just do it. And now again, I meet with my little home church two, sometimes three times a week. And we do have communion. We share, you Amen. know, bread and wine together, Amen. all that kind of, of thing. And I can feel when... um we're in the flow, right? I can feel that. Um, but I'm still too intellectual about it. So again, one of one of my interests in orthodoxy is that it is so tactile. It is so tangible. Mm -hmm. It is so just get down on your knees and say the words, praise God, just say it. And again, for me as a, as a, um, a re reformationist, I would say, uh, Protestant to even just say, even just to do this, like, you know, the, 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 the churches that put their hands in the air and do mm -hmm. all this, it's just like, oh, I can't do that. I really can't. Whereas orthodoxy is just like, get down on your knees, get down it, say it, say it, say it, say it, and let it go through you rather than having to come up with yeah. it yourself. And that, yeah. and I'm just thinking, okay, it may be, this is more true or this is more true, but it could be that this is just what I need to to come back to that re-enchantment in a different yeah. way. But then it becomes very relativistic uh, but, and that's where the danger no, comes in, right? Yeah, so, but I wouldn't attack I wouldn't attack on that. I would say that there is I mean, look, what I always tell my friends, I was taught about the risen Christ from a heretic named my mom. <laughs> my mom was an was an Anglican. She was a Protestant who and they on some level were we're teaching heresy. Like there's no way around that. And so what I'm trying to say is that's the person that introduced me to the ability to even know Christ and find the church. So the idea that there wouldn't be lots of ways in play that you might, and I might come to something like a higher understanding, that seems perfectly understandable to me. Cool. Cool. You know we'll I mean? have a good, another good conversation about that. So before we go, because I, I know last time you asked me the question, I don't know if you're going to ask me today. Probably How do not. I, I want to hear this. <laughs> okay. Here's the question. How do I bring in all these bigger thoughts? How how do I transmit that to kids? What am I bringing in my classroom oh, yeah, yeah. that I think That's of the most value yeah. to children? And it totally ties in wonderfully with what we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. And that is beauty. Because, again, you could frame what you just said about, you did, the atheist out in the field. He is drawn, he is spoken to by the beauty that's there that's drawing him to the next level right so we, we can talk about that too in terms of e even ancient greek idea of psychagogia mm, where you recognize yeah, the individual beauty in fantastic. something so a beautiful woman but then to under to really appreciate or to recognize a beautiful woman the individual you have to also know the category what a beautiful woman is generally yeah right yeah. For yeah. this specific yeah. person. And then above that, there's the ultimate level of, well, what is beauty? Mm -hmm. Period. Okay. So it's always drawing it. Fractal is actually the, the new word for it, I guess. It's fractal because it's drawing you up through different layers that have the same structure and embedded in each other, drawing you up towards that ultimate beauty. So in my classroom, I my little tag on my emails says, Music education, to me, what is music education? It's discovering or sharing, sharing in the discovery. Oh, let me do it again. Sharing the joy of discovering the world of music and the world through music. Okay? So it's joy. 
its discovery, the beauty that is in music and the beauty that is in the world through music, because I happen to be a music teacher. If I were a classroom teacher, I would bring the beauty in other ways, but it just, it's on a platter when you've got, when you've got music, right? So again, it's a wonderful way. And you used to think like, oh, music teacher in my building, I'm the person who fills in your half an hour prep time. That's it. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> Send the kids to me for half an hour so you can get your prep time, right? And um, and I'm also the person who puts on those great shows and isn't it nice that the kids sing? Until I remind people of the joy that they see in these children's faces when they're on the stage all together and they're singing their hearts out and, yeah, they're, yeah. and they're so pleased to be sharing in the joy of having created something beautiful together that they're sharing with their parents and their parents are beaming at them. The whole thing of community, all the work, all the hard work, all the achievement, all the excellence, all the satisfaction, yeah. all the beauty that they're able to share in that moment of joy of performing. So I try to bring that into my classroom all the time. So whenever we do a song, we are doing, oh, this song is from Bo- uh, Molly. And this is where they were singing it. This is what the people, this yeah, is what the words yeah, mean. What, and here's yeah, some pictures of the people. And this is how they were sharing it. Now, again, I've been able to go under the wire of political correctness because I do a very multicultural program. So by, by nobody the way, can come and tell face, me I'm not. And why not? Because there's nothing wrong with many cultures. Absolutely. So. And I'm all for multicultural, no, not for multiculturalism. I'm all for celebrating cultures around the world. I am not. I'm not from a multiculturalism because that's a different thing. But I am all about that, but not with that whole baggage of white guilt. So I'm all about celebrating everybody's culture, but just let's let's. This is a beautiful tome right there to a proper teaching perspective. So let's keep going because there's more to talk about, but let's let's cut it here. And then what we'll do is we'll keep talking we could talk about three souls too. I'm going to talk to you off camera about that. But in another time, in a near, very near future, we'll we'll keep talking. Okay, and maybe yeah, you'll come to know. one of these artatomatas. But I don't know; they're kind of expensive. But they help us a lot at first things. They help us a lot. Uh, mm. So we'll figure it out. Okay, so guys, Doctor Don. Oh, so go ahead. Don, sorry, Don's going to keep gonna going, say- guys. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, and remember, you said you wanted to come to Winnipeg sometime. So that'd oh, be great too. That's check. <laughs> yeah. I'm serious. We already, we talked about this stuff. Yeah. For Guys, sure. Dr. Dawn Muir, who is, I can see her coming back often. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, what good insight and a lot of for us to learn from what you said. So guys, Dawn, uh, we'll see you and um, everybody, we'll see you soon <laughs> on uh on heavy things lately. Okay, well, look, here's what I think. I think this woman with all this interesting heritage teaching with these deep philosophical ideas and infusing them into her work as a teacher of the arts, I think it gives us great insight into somebody trying to do something like not forget the past while also wrestling with the benefits of the future and the benefits of the present. So post postmodernism, we just watched Don Muir wrestle with it. Guys, www.first-things.org. Remember, our restaurant is looking for a leader and it's awesome. I just can't do it. Otherwise I would do it. I gotta do this other stuff. Our restaurant is looking for a leader and our nonprofit where we send people and change their lives and also affect the lives of others in a positive way. This Peace Corps style of orthodox ethos type thing is also looking for field workers. And finally, we're all always looking for monthly donors. People who chip in 10, 20, 30, 100 each month to say, I got your back. Because it's the internet. I don't know how the energy works on the internet, but love, right? Beauty, truth, they defy gravity. And so good things are happening. Um, And they happen in great numbers when people offer just a little bit of what they have. And so whatever you have, consider it as a tithe. Consider it however you want to do it. 
go to our website and jump on monthly. And we'll talk each month and we'll get inside baseball on all of these deep ideas. Guys, thank you. Heavy Things Lightly, see you next week. A lot of cool interviews coming up. Including, go check out a book, Orphan X. It's This interesting author is coming on soon, Greg Hurwitz. He, I don't know about it. This is going to be interesting. Anyway, lots more Father Turbo's coming up. I hope you guys are good. God bless. Take care.